We are in the midst of the a, a, a Gospel of Mark. We, we've been doing that here for almost all, uh, two years off and on. We've kind of taken some breaks here and there. But we're spending this Lenten season, which is the up from Ash Wednesday to Easter. Uh, and it's a time of more serious reflection, and it, it seems kind of appropriate that Mark would be the great ending uh, for this because it's once we get to chapter 11, and we've gone basically systematically from beginning to end for the most part, Chapter 11 on is the last week of Jesus' life. So it spends five chapters going through that for a Lenten season, so it seems perfect that it works out. Uh, The thing is, and I think it's in the spirit of Lent, you've already found out if you've been here long enough for Lent, uh, it's really, really challenging stuff that Mark is throwing out there. He does not pull any punches. Obviously, he portrays Jesus as not pulling any punches, and obviously that means... um, I seem to not pull any punches either, talking about some of these things. And we're on today. Do you have your fort built, you know, whatever, ready to get shot at? And I would say it's really interesting after this past week, um, and I was talking with some other people that are not associated with this community uh, about some of these things. So they're like, hey, what's your church like? I'm like, what do I say? I said, hey, well, I mean, last week we gave a teaching that was entitled, Is Jesus a Republican? And they just kind of look at me. <laughs> I'm like... I mean, I could talk to you more about it if you want, but there you go. <laughs> They're like, oh, okay. And then they move like five seats over. And, but yeah, I mean, th- th- that goes to say, if you were here last week, it kind of proved my point of what happens. And I, I, I hate to tell you, today, unfortunately, I'm going to continue the vibe a little bit. I, I don't know if it'll be as intense, but it's a little different topic. That's why I said Jesus and governments, because this is the popular text about Caesar and his taxes. And so uh, it kind of necessitate, necessitates that we talk about it a little bit. But it'll be a good time, I promise. Uh, and we're going to read verses 13 to 17 uh, today. And I'm going to read out of the New English Translation uh, this morning. So this is, a, if you remember uh, last week, the chief priests were the main group that were confronting Jesus. Now we've moved on to another couple groups of people. It says, then they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians, this is actually the Sanhedrin that did this, to trap him with his own words. And when they came, uh, they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and do not court anyone's favor because you show no partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Truth, it is right, uh, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But he saw through their hypocrisy and said to them, Why are you testing me? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. So they brought one and he said to them, Whose image is this and whose inscription? They replied, Caesar's. Then Jesus said to them, Give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were utterly amazed at him. Let's pray together. God, I just ask in these moments that my words be your words, that you would remove all the barriers that we put ahead of ourselves to not listen to something fresh and different. And God, I pray a fresh word would happen today. And God, I know you speak to each of us individually. I also pray that you speak to us corporately as a body of how you'd wanted to live this good news out seven days a week. In the name of Jesus, I ask this, and everybody said, amen. Well, if a little bit of a risk uh, with some of the stuff I talked about, kind of tiptoeing, well, I, I'm, I'm lying. I wasn't tiptoeing. I just kind of jumped right to the deep end uh, last week with the American political discourse with our faith. And today is kind of a little bit of a continuation of that, but just in a different type of arena. And this text kind of necessitates the continuance of that trend because of the question that is asked of Jesus. And we're going to walk through what that meant to them because it, it, we have to understand, like, w- why is this such a big deal? Why this question? And what is at stake for how Jesus responds to this? I don't know uh, if you've ever noticed this in America. Um, you know, our country is called the land of the free, the home of the brave, right? I like to say that the America is the land of black and white um, because it seems that in a lot of conversations, in a lot of the way we posture ourselves, be a, a phrase that is always proposed when we start talking about things, especially things that we disagree on. Something like, you're either this or you're that. Right? You're either fill in the blank with whatever, fill in the blank with the opposite. And it's interesting because America is really good at this. If you talk to people from around the world, they don't have as much passion about making things black and white than Americans do. And and this is also, because we live in this country, this is also seeped in to the church and how we think about things. Uh, Some people really like that. They're like, if I could have a world that's black and white, it would be nice. And I agree with you. 
it would be really cool if things were just one th side of the other and we just knew which one was right and wrong. It would be much easier to live life, right? That's why people like it. However, we recognize quickly, and if you have a relationship with anybody that exists, <laughs> you're going to find out really quick that things aren't so black and white, right? There's always some complexities. There's always multiple layers. It's more like an onion, right? I mean, it's kind of like they've got multiple layers to it. Uh, it can get more intense as you get closer to the center. And complexity. But the situation that Jesus is put under is one of these situations. They're asking an either-or type question. Are you this or this? And then they ask it about a particular issue. And so Mark throws out two groups of people. We talked about the Sanhedrin last week, which was the Jewish ruling council. So they make all the legal decisions. Moral, social, political life, that's what they do. And so like when there's a complication where the Torah is really vague, the Sanhedrin is the official ruling council that says this is what the interpretation is. They sent these next two groups of people, which we've already encountered. The Pharisees, interesting, if you know about these two groups, they are two polar opposite groups. So the Pharisees are, you know, we've talked about this before, and they've been mentioned many times in this gospel already. They're like, for lack of a better term, to use today's terminology, they're like the ancient middle class evangelicals of the ancient world for Jewish people. That's, that's what the Pharisees are. They are people who love their Bible and memorize a lot of it. They also have an oral tradition, a commentary that goes along with that Bible. They've memorized that too, and subsequent to that, they have a particular interpretation of how that works, which is theirs. And they enforce that upon people. And they're the, they're the people who are really serious about the Bible. Of all the groups of Jewish people, of the, sex, the political sects around, the Pharisee Bible, that really do try to follow the scriptures. And their mentality of why Israel is being oppressed is because they sin too much. We did too much wrong. We didn't listen to God enough. So we need to stop sinning to get back with God. And so their solution to that is basically become the Bible fact checkers. They're going to make sure that everyone gets in line so that we can be back on top again. And that consumes them. So they're always concerned about doctrine. They're always concerned about making sure that people follow the right doctrine, which, by the way, happens to be theirs. Because we found out in the Gospel of Mark already, there's been moments where they have taken passages in the Torah, it doesn't even come close to saying. For example, Mark chapter 7, we talked about this. They have these hand-washing rituals that were only reserved for a specific group of Jewish people, and the only way you become that is if you're born into it. But they applied it to all people and all times and all places, because that never happens today. That only happens in Bible times, right? The Pharisees. And then you have the Herodians who are fully in cahoots with the Roman Empire. They love Roman philosophy. They love their religion. They want everything Roman. That's what they want. And they actually so much were in cahoots with the Romans that the Romans made some of them rulers over the rest of the Jewish people, even if they weren't fully Jewish, such as Herod, since that's they're named after Herod. The Herodians makes sense. That's the Herodians. So, I mean, for lack of better terms, to use today's terminologies, you've got two groups of people. You have the controls right? That's basically what is set up here with Mark. The Sanhedrin send both of these groups to Jesus together, like as one voice, which in some ways you're like, wow, that's pretty awesome. I mean, a, a bipartisan effort to talk to Jesus. Isn't that great? It says right in the beginning of the text, they, they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians, listen, to trap him with his own words. So they have no interest in having a dialogue. They have no interest in the answer to Jesus, the question they're going to ask Jesus. They are wanting to find a way to get him arrested or to get him killed or both. That's what they want. That's the motivation for what they're doing. And so they have a setup question. Hey, Jesus, not. This is the question that they're using to trap him. I don't know if you've... Uh, I mean, you think about the way they did this, because it, before, it's really interesting, because they go through this whole, like, couple lines of flattery, right? Hey, we know that you're truthful, you don't court anyone's favor because you show no partiality, you teach the way of God in accordance with truth. We already know that's a lie, because they, it says they're trying to trap him. Have you ever had someone just kind of, just have the compliments flow over you? Just like telling you how great you are, or man, I really like whatever, and then they use the word but. 
That one word, man, that's three letters, really, really just bore us like it's irrelevant. It doesn't make any sense. Which, by the way, if you really want to talk like that, just use the word and instead and see what happens. It does make you think a little different, makes you pause. But that's what they're doing. Hey, I'm going to tell you how great you are, but let's ask this question. Or yeah, if, he make, if we make him feel awesome and make him feel like he's the one, and then we get him. We, we ask that question that's going to get him, and we'll catch him off guard. That's what they're trying to do with this question. But what in the world are they talking about with Caesar? And this is part of the Roman government. He's the emperor. What, why is this such a big issue? What's interesting, if, if you think about any hot topic today, you, you can fill in the blank with whatever topic that is like at the top of the media. Think about the really divisive, controversial, intense discussions that are happening today, and that is exactly this type of question that they're asking Jesus. This is the hot topic amongst the Jewish people, one of the questions. Because they're not supposed to be submitting to, and now this Roman Empire is ruling over them, and now they have their money. But here's the thing about money. Money isn't just about having money. Money is also about propaganda. Money is their advertisement in the ancient world. So they have, they have coins, and we'll talk about this in a moment. They have coins, and their coins communicate particular messages. I don't know, uh, what's interesting to know about the background of this, I don't know if you remember the Christmas story in the moment where they had to take, there's a census being taken. Do you remember this part of the story? To register for the census that the Roman Empire instituted. It says this in the beginning of the Gospels. Matthew and Luke, I believe. And they had to take a census. And the reason that the census was taken is because the Roman government wanted to tax the... The other part of that story is the Tetrarch, or the ruling uh, uh, person in the province of Judea, was Herod. There's two different Herods, actually, that are mentioned in the Bible. They just don't distinguish them apart a lot. But he, his rule ended in the year 6. This is, that's the same Herod that ordered all Jewish boys are killed because of this, this Messiah that was supposed to be the new king. That's that Herod. He failed in the year six, ousted, and then his son takes over eventually, whose name is Tiberius. But in the, when Herod was failing at his job of trying to help out Rome, there was a revolt that came about that was led by a man named Judas of Galilee. That's what they call him, Judas of Galilee. The only way we know that is you look, you can look in Acts chapter 5, verse 37, it talks about it. It talks about how uh, because of the census, he led a revolt of the people. And then it tells you he's killed. So he rises up in revolt against Rome, he's killed, and all of his followers are scattered. Which, by the way, is the mantra that has happened over and over and over again for about 100 to 150 years. People would rise up against the Roman government, the Roman government would kill them all, or scatter them, or enslave them, or both. And then we move on. And they're constantly trying to do this. The reason they put Herod in power is to keep people from being insurrectionists and riot against us. And that's why there's a lot of cahoots with the Roman Empire, because, hey, if someone rises up to rebel against us, we're going to have to have a heavy hand, because that's the Pax Romana. That's the Roman peace. That's what it's all about, because Rome's way is the best way to live. And so the tax thing was a really big deal because most pay tribute to Rome. That was the majority opinion of the Jewish people. We do not want to pay this tax to Caesar because it's also saying that we are submitting to his authority. And we don't want to do that because we're God's chosen people. And so Jesus, how does he respond to this? Testing me. So he sees, it says, I see you through their hypocrisy, but... The word testing is, is also, like, I think it's not strong enough a word. But basically, he, the, the way that the translation is in the context is, like, he says, literally, why are you trying to trap me in your question? Like, he just calls it out. Like, you're, you're getting me to say something that's going to get me in trouble. So then he says, give me a denarius. And it's very specific in the text. It doesn't say, give me a coin. It says, give me a denarius, because actually during the revolt, some of the Jewish people minted their own coins, so they wouldn't have the Roman coins. So there's, I mean, there's all sorts of controversy surrounding this issue. So Jesus says, give me a denarius, which is a Roman coin. Let me show you a picture of what that looks like. Now we can show the picture. This is the coin 
that Jesus got. And if you look at this coin, this is actually the Emperor Tiberius on the front, and on the back is actually his mother, Livia, and there's an inscription, because you remember in the text it says, whose image is on it? Caesar, that's Tiberius Caesar. Uh, and what's the inscription? Well, the inscription, you can see it there in Greek. I won't try to pronounce it Greek because I'll butcher it probably. But basically, this is what it meant, the front inscription. said, Tiberius Caesar, son of divine Augustus, emperor. Now, often the Caesars would declare themselves the son of God. This is something that was said a lot in the Roman Empire. That's the front inscription. And in the rear inscription, it says Pontiff Maxim, which means high priest. So the Roman emperor is the high priest of the Roman Empire, which means he's in charge of all the religious and political dealings of the entire empire. He's the emperor. That's how it works. And the thing is that you have to understand is politics and religion are married together. They're just one, which, by the way, that's still true, even though we want to say it's different. Even if you had a separation, those things get married together a lot. That is what is on the inscription of this coin. So it's, it's not just a has monetary value. It is also propaganda to get you to understand a message that Caesar is the son of God. He is in charge of all religious and political life in the realm. And, there, and even if you look at the picture of Libya, put the coin back up, uh, there's, a, there's a spear you can see that she's holding onto in the back. The spear is actually reversed, and the reason that is is because the, that they have issued peace. The Pax Romana, the Roman peace. The thing is, <laughs> their way that they do peace is through violence and force, which is basically, hey, submit to our way or we will kill you or enslave you. Because our way is the best way, you'll learn. Don't say that. Oh, I did say it. So that's what happened. Because that's what, that's what they did. I'm just telling you what they did. That is on this coin. That is the Pax Romana. That's the piece they know. So, obviously, if you pay taxes to Caesar, it's like, are you submitting yourself to these pagan, idolatrous ways? I mean, this is the question they're trying to get Jesus to answer. Because here's the thing. If Jesus says yes pay taxes to Caesar, then he's going to lose all credibility with the people that he's been with this whole time because they don't want to pay tribute to Rome. And he says, pay taxes, then you're just, you're compromising, Jesus. You're, you, you don't understand our place, Jesus. And if he says no, don't, the Herodians and the Pharisees can label him an insurrectionist and have him accused of treason, which is crucifixion which does happen anyway, so you kind of get the picture of what they thought of him eventually. That's what they're trying to do. So if he answers one way or the other, either or, he's in trouble. He says, give me a denarius. And then he says, whose image is on this? Caesar's. What's the inscription? They go through the inscription. And then he says, give to Caesar's what is Caesar's, and to God's what is God's. What, what, what does he mean by that? The key word in this text is the word image. That's because as soon as they get them to say whose image it is, then he can answer the question faithfully. Here's the irony. I think about it. He says, give me a denarius, and the Pharisees and Herodians are going through their coin purses, searching for a Roman coin amongst them. They pull out a coin, a Roman coin. To most people who don't want to pay tribute to Rome, you think when they ask the question, it's like, you should be carrying Roman coins because you're a Jew. But he says, give me today's, and they pull a Roman coin out of their own purse. They look like idiots when they do this. Smirking, I don't know. I don't know what the Chosen will do when they ever do this. I don't know if they're going to do this, but you know, they pull out the coin and like, it's already foolish enough that they're pulling out a Roman coin with this image because they're already violating their own question. Okay, here's the narrative. And then, hey, whose image is on it? And he just keeps going on and on and on. And so what's interesting, it's like it's completely disarming to what they're expecting him to answer. He doesn't answer yes or no at all. He's like, it, it, it's like a third way alternative. It's not because he's trying to, but he wants to show them how ridiculous their, their question is and, what the, and, and really reveal their character, which is not good, right? It's, it's hypocritical. They don't have any intention of wanting to know the answer to this question. That's a hot topic. Him arrested. That's the whole 
motivation. And here's the thing about image. So Caesar's image is on this coin, and Jewish people pay attention to when a word is mentioned the first time in the Bible. Do you know when the word image was mentioned for the first time in the Bible? Genesis, talking about human beings, where God says that all human beings are made in God's image. Mark definitely wants you to pay attention to that. God's image, because what are all of these groups of people doing? They are finding ways to treat certain people as less than human. And Jesus is like, look, all human beings are God's image. Whose image is on this? Caesar. Well, give to him what Caesar. Look, it's a coin. Guess what? In the realm of eternity, you're not going to really take that with you. So he can have it. Look, some of you probably use Roman roads and use all the benefits of empire. You know what? Then you pay taxes. Okay. But it's just a piece of metal. It's just money. But the image of God, to say that you're an image bearer of God, just this piece of metal. Jesus is saying, look, if you are made in the image of God, which all of you are, the call is you submit your whole self to God. In fact, in just a couple passages, which I think we might talk about, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, is the passage we uh, recite every Sunday when we start worship. You want to know what he's going to call them to, it's that. Hey, love God, heart, your mind, your soul, your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love every single person as if they are made in God's image. That's what he's going to tell them in like a couple paragraphs. This little coin, yeah, give the, give the Caesar what's Caesar's. And to God's, what's God's? What's God's? All of you. Which is a call to them. It's another moment of Jesus giving people space, change their thinking, to repent, to say, look, you are not giving your whole self. The evidence is in the question you asked me. I'm giving you a chance to change your thinking. And of course, they don't do that. And what's really interesting is like the way, because you want to crawl like, how do... Why are these fairies of Sanhedrin, why are they so just like entrenched in their particular posture? I mean, because, I mean, we talked about this last week. You're like, you're so, like, when I said you, you've been so certain that you're right about something. Like, and you just like, and you, you're like an evangelist for that position or that topic or whatever. And speaking like, what, do you, what, what happens when you find out you're wrong? What do you do? It's really disruptive. It can shake your world. That's what it did to me. So, I told you a couple examples last week of that. But there are people that are so entrenched. In this case, it's all revolved around your identity in this. And I, I, I said governments because some, Caesar is tied into this with this question. But I want you to imagine a group of people who confuse their earthly identities with their God-given identity. I know it's hard to go there because it's Bible times, but just imagine that for a moment. And what do I mean by earthly identities? I don't know. Your political party. Your national identity. Your city or your state. Or your school. Or your ethnicity. Or what's the God-given identity? The God-given identity is the image. The God-given identity is you are made in God's image. That is your God-given identity. You know, it's really interesting. I was having conversations with people just a couple, two or three days ago of noticing how many times we put the words God-given before our particular postures on things. Like it's some type of divine, like, now my, my way is the way, right? Which is exactly what the Pharisees and the Herodians are doing. This is my God-given. This is my God-given. The only thing that's God-given to you is that you're made in God's image. That's what's God-given. That's what we know. That's what they know. But they turn it into something else. They take an earthly identity, identity to, to associate themselves as their priority identity. This is who I am. And Jesus is confronting that. 
Because what's interesting, I said this last week, as much as people say you shouldn't preach politics in the pulpit, I mean, this is extremely political, <laughs> this conversation. And Mark is very intentional about pointing this out because God is trying to form a political body. The body is the church. That's the political body. And this political body, which again is a group of people organized under an authority, who is Jesus, have particular practices and ways of living that they do together and how they live in the world. That is who Mark is calling out, calling for. This is the gospel to Christians, remember? This is a, a gospel written to the church about how to live as a disciple of Jesus. I'm looking for a group of people to live a particular way, which has been the story all along from the beginning of the Bible to now. The story has not changed. That's who God is looking for. And by the way, if you read to the end of the story of the Bible in Revelation, you realize that that group of people, that political body, is made up of every tribe, every tongue, every nation. <laughs> right? That's what it says in Revelation 7, 9. That means any ethnicity, any group of people, any language, they're all together as this one body united under the authority, Jesus. That's the end of the story. That is who Mark is showing of what is being formed, what Jesus is doing. And these groups are saying, no, we're right. This is the way you should live. No, this is the way you should live. No, this is, and they just like bicker and bicker and bicker because their identity is wrapped up in that. I'm a Pharisee. I'm a Herodian. I'm a Essene. I'm a Zealot, whatever. There's all sorts of groups, right? I'm a Sadducee. That's the next passage. This means that we invite especially those people who are different than us to the table. It means that we should treat all human beings with dignity and worth, no matter if they agree with our positions on whatever or anything else. And some of you are like, you know what, I, I'm, I'm good with this. I, I'm, I'm good at this. I'm going I'm to tell you, I'm not always good at this. Because the question I have to ask myself, am I really welcoming all people? Do I have moments where I'm just established my earthly identity as my priority identity? Here's how you know if you're doing that. And this, our, by the way, our country trains you to do this every single moment. And that is this. They train you to vilify people who don't agree with you. That is the way that you know that you are not treating every human with dignity and worth made in God's image, is that you vilify you turn everybody that doesn't agree with you or that you don't like into an enemy. Do, have you paid attention to who Jesus is like interacting with in this gospel so far? It's everybody. It's even the people who are trying to kill him. Right? He doesn't just shut them out and leave. I'm not going to talk to you anymore because you're not going to listen to me. He doesn't. He's like, okay, we'll engage in conversation. He already knows I'm not going to listen, but we're going to have a conversation. That. Well, this is part of my job. Sorry, I've been here a few years. you got to deal with it. But that's what he's saying. It's every single person, right? So he doesn't, like, he doesn't discriminate who he talks to just because he doesn't like their posture. He welcomes the conversation. Now, it doesn't mean that he is going to, you know, it's, I think a lot of people think, well, Jesus is just nice to everybody. Obviously, he's not. I mean, there's moments where, you know, some people have to learn the hard way, and this is like the umpteenth conversation that he's had with these groups of people. But he always gives them space. He always engages them. And he doesn't vilify them. That's what we always are encouraged to do. We do, this in the, we do this in the church too, right? I mean, I, if I, this is why these words matter. This is what's interesting. Think about the words that divide us. If I say, are you a liberal? Are you a progressive? Are you a conservative? Already, I'm putting some label on that's divisive, aren't I? 
It doesn't matter if that characterizes whatever that posture is. The fact that I had used, well, that's just something the liberals would say. Or that's just something the conservatives would say. Or the evangelicals. Or whatever. You fill in the blank with whatever you want. Right? But all those words already divide when you say those types of things. And Jesus is not interested in division. I mean, the, the end of the story is all tribes, tongues, and nations united together under Jesus. This is authority. That's the, that's the vision. That's what Mark's trying to do in communicating this. And so if you're doing that in your language and in your conversations with people, why are you surprised that you're getting resistance? Why are you surprised that people are trying to break relationship with you? See, I mean, I don't know about you. I think that people are looking for a church that doesn't vilify other people. And we have done a whole history of things to do that. I don't know, ever heard of the Crusades? <laughs> what do you think that is? There's, a, there's pagans, there's an enemy, we have to conquer them because we are the right way, so we'll just kill you and take over your land. Does that sound like the way of Jesus? I mean, Jesus is going to the cross. It doesn't sound, that's completely the opposite of what's happening. But that's our history. That's part of our history. We have to like, admit that and know that. And there's lots of other things. Is your primary identity based on earthly ones? That's one thread. The other thread, we talked about at the beginning with this either or, is speaking against two extremes. This is what our country likes to do, to push us to extremes. In fact, I, when I told you last week, when I mentioned the teaching where I talked about who I, who I didn't vote for in the 2016 election, that's all I said at that, that teaching, like four and a half years ago, like, someone came up to me afterwards and said, man, that was a great sermon, which I was like, wow, that's amazing. Uh, because, but you know what? We're going to lose the extremes of our people in our church. <laughs> Maybe. I'm not sure. Well, we did lose 40% of our people in the next six months, but hey, there's all sorts of reasons. But Jesus is always like, say, look, you don't have to push for the extremes here. This is not how this works. Because one of them thought, Jesus needs to be the violent revolutionary. Again, he had the parade. We talked about this two weeks, two, two weeks ago, Palm Sunday, right? They're waving the palm fronds, which is uh, going back to the Maccabean Revolt like 150 years earlier. This is what happened. Overthrow the government. Yay, this is what we want. We, Jesus is an insurrectionist. That's what we want. And Jesus is like, uh, no. That's not, the, that's not the way. That's not what I'm here to do. So definitely, he's not some violent insurrectionist. Which makes me ask some questions about our current situation. But anyway, that's another sermon, I guess. And then you got the other end of it, the other extreme, which is just let the government take over. Well, he doesn't go for that either, right? And, and we know in history that both of these extremes are bad. If you think about this. If, if you think about if, if a church is in charge of the government, that has not ended well. Hence the Crusades, right? That's when church was the ruling thing over the government. The government did their bidding. That's what happened. Or you flip it, and the government controls the church. That's what Nazi Germany was doing. Those are both bad, right? And that's why Jesus doesn't associate himself with political sects. It's like, look, those are earthly identities. It doesn't mean that you can't have an opinion. It doesn't mean that you can't have a posture toward things or have these discussions. But at the end of the day, if you are a disciple, your authority is Jesus and Jesus alone. And sometimes that challenges particular postures of political parties and sects on both sides of the aisle in our case, right? And, and so we live in this tension of like, how do we like wrestle with this? Give to Caesar what is Caesar and God what is God. By the way, do you know that the scriptures attest that God is in control of the government in an interesting way? That he's Lord over Caesar? So like, look, if you're, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, God's, God's much bigger than Caesar. You should rest in that. And Jesus knows this. I mean, I think about, I, I, here's a great example of, of, of trying to think through this a little bit, because I, I know it can be a struggle. Like, we have some systems in our government 
that are designed to help those who are the most vulnerable, right? We talked about this a couple weeks ago, that that's part of the call of the church, is to come alongside those who are marginalized. And there are some churches who think these systems in government are a really bad idea, right? And there's all sorts of words that get used, you know, handouts, right? Um, I think in some ways, I, I mean, I, I do understand the critique, because there's certain ways, like, it just makes it easy for people instead of, like, trying to have some sort of dignity or whatever. But some people are interested. The systems are all broken. We don't already know that. I mean, handing out something brings temporary relief, and sometimes that's needed and necessary. Um, but it's not in the long term helpful. That's what some people argue on particular political platforms, right, about all this when they have this discussion. And then we get upset when the government uses our taxes to fund these programs. And people have all sorts of great debate and discussion, right? This is where it gets fun. This is where the fun stuff is, friends. When I start talking about this, I guess my question is, what has the church done for the forgotten? Because the way that God has set it up is for the church to be the body of people who come alongside those who are forgotten and offer hospitality and service. That's the call. I mean, that's what Jesus has judged the temple for two two weeks ago. And as much as we can, I mean, people can campaign for all they want about government help. And look, I'm not, I think it's noble that governments try to help those who are marginalized. Sometimes I think it's because the church hasn't done an effective job of doing that, that they're doing that in the first place. And at the same time, we live in this tension that, well, what can the church do to step up? Well, the church obviously hasn't done a full job, so some of them are. I mean, there's a lot of great efforts that churches are doing to do this, right? But what do you do about this? You just got to remember, look, the church is the group of people who are supposed to show the world what God is like. So we really should just focus on that. It doesn't mean you can't have discussions about government policy. Some of you are really good at that and very knowledgeable and way above my head of trying to talk through those policies and stuff. I don't understand it all. I'm not, like, I'm not a government person to know how that works, but I appreciate like, your competency in that. At the end, I'm just like, what are we called to do as a church body I mean, we can argue about government programs and our taxes, but I just say give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. And what to give to God is your whole self and to pay attention to things God cares about because the church is God's body politic. The church should be the body that is offering hospitality and service to all people. Regardless of the earthly identities, they want to prioritize or you. I mean, that is it's so perfect today that we do communion. Because if you want to talk about identity, this is where it is for Jesus. I mean, and we're going to do this in a, a few weeks with a Passover Seder. Because it's, it's a Passover Seder meal, which we ta- we've kind of talked about. It's a Jewish festival, in a sense, remembering that God delivered his people from Egypt. This is the central place that Jesus is forming his disciples' identity if you think about it. He's at this Last Supper. He's looking around the table. By the way, think about the makeup of those guys that he called, those 12 closest to him. Do you think they all were from the slain political group? Uh, No. (laughs) They were from all over the place. And they're all together, walking together and doing life together for like three years. Do you think that those conversations weren't heated at moments? Yeah. Yeah. They're all together at the table. Jesus takes the bread and says, this is my body broken for you. Every time you eat of this, you do this in remembrance of me. And we've talked about this word remembrance. It's word anamnesis, which basically is like a picture on your phone or a file, right? It's not about the file or the picture that's significant. It's the memory that it evokes. And what they literally think is it's transporting that memory into the present moment. Do this in remembrance of me. This moment. Transfer this now to this moment. That's what he's saying when you, when you remember this. My body broken for you, which obviously hasn't happened yet among them, right? This is going to happen. Then he takes the cup of the new covenant, which they know about from Jeremiah in their Passover Seder. It says, this is the cup of the new covenant, my blood that's shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink of this, you do this in remembrance of me. Remembrance, anamnesis, same word. Take this and transport it into the present moment. So there's a couple things happening. One is, it's a declaration of who God is. This is the way that God is showing how to live. 
I am breaking myself open and pouring myself out. It is not someone that's pursuing power and privilege or silencing other voices. It's welcoming everyone to the table to partake and to recognize that the path is through the cross. That's what Mark's setting up. And because of anamnesis, transferring this present moment, it becomes an identity marker for us. Jesus wants you to identify as this. My church is supposed to be a group of people that breaks themselves open and pours themselves out for the sake of the world because that's what I did. And you are my priest. You were supposed to represent me and what I am and what I look like. And that is the invitation to them. And friends, if you think about this, anything you talk about, anything you live, anything you, you, you get in disagreements about, if this is not the central identity for you as a disciple, there's not many kind words for you in Scripture about that. And not a, it's not as a threat, it's just a reality. Like, this is... I mean, this is God's desire. This is what he's trying to do. This is how Jesus lived. I mean, we've, we've followed the whole gospel. This is what he's doing. Even with people who want to kill him. It's cra- I mean, think about that. If someone wanted to kill you, you usually don't want to be around them. But he did. I mean, I'm not saying just, hey, go around and people want to murder you. I don't know who wants to murder you. Hopefully nobody. But like, you know, you get it. I mean, this is what he's doing. And this is what he's inviting his people into. It's crazy. It's a hard thing, but man, when people embody this kind of reality, I mean, it is the flourishing life. And most of you in here, I don't know all of you, have experienced this from people, haven't you? There's a technical word called incarnation. We've said this before. It just means in the flesh. But it's an incarnational, an in-the-flesh presence to people of someone who lives us out among you that has made you compelled to follow Jesus or at least to consider him, right? I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess that most of you might have had someone like that in your life. And friends, I'm telling you, that is the call to us. It's, it's not to take our earthly identities. And look, there's, there's a lot of story and richness in those identities, it doesn't mean you negate those stories. It doesn't mean you don't embrace those as part of who you are. But that is not your primary identity if you are a follower of Jesus. Your primary identity is, I am a person made in God's image, a human being. That's the primary identity God has given us. And God is looking for a group of people who will show the world that every single human being has that kind of worth to God. That's what he's looking for. And then these practices that they embody, which, by the way, we have five core values that line up with a lot of what the narrative of Scripture is saying, is one of the ways that we, our mission statement, live the good news, live the gospel to do. This communion table is the central part of where we have our identity. This is what Jesus is calling his people to do. So I have no idea what this has brought up with you today or where you're at. I mean, I even got little kids speaking out against me today. It's great. (laughs) Whatever that is for you, Think about the people that were that presence to you. Because there, there are people that were. And the, the call to us is, can we continue or maybe start to be that type of presence to others? And I mean, that's a hard thing to ask, by the way. It's not easy. Because there are people who will want to well, kill you figuratively. We'll say, hopefully not actually want to kill you. But there will be people who will ridicule you. There will be people who think you're nuts. There will be people who think you're wishy-washy or whatever they want to label. But Jesus came for them as well. And maybe through your life, maybe the flawed lives that we have, maybe God's presence would be experienced and point them to Jesus. So when you come today, if that's something that you want to be a part of, then I would invite you to come to this table and take it. And we don't have, just to let you know if you haven't been here before, um, anybody's welcome to this table. We don't have like scanners that, you know, are you a Christian? Or We, we don't know. 
You know, and also, it's not like, hey, do I have to be a, a ministry partner or a member of this church? No. Jesus invites this to everyone who wants to come to this table because basically, you're, what, this is like taking this as signing up for something. When I take this, I'm identifying with this. That's what you're doing. So if you want to do that, then you're welcome to come. But if you don't want to do that, I would invite you not to come because it's a, this is how important it is to us. That's why they call it a sacrament. It's like this mystery of like, it's ordinary thing, but it points to something much more meaningful to us. Then you can come. So let me pray for us as we do that. God, I just ask that in these moments that we're about to take this bread and cup, that we recognize all the ways that we tend to distance ourselves from other people, whether we say vilifying words, make them the enemy, whatever it is, God, I pray that you would enlarge our love, enlarge that, that you would break down our barriers and walls to change our thinking, that every single person is made in God's image, someone that you love and died for and continue to pursue. And God, I pray that our practices will be the same as how you practiced and what you did and what you showed us. And that would point to you, God, through Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And everybody said, amen. Hey, thanks for watching the podcast. If you want to connect with us, click one of the links uh, in the description there to get to our page where there's all sorts of ways that you can find out more information about our church community, uh, what we're doing, and how you can get involved with that. Uh, hope you continue to stay. Make sure you like and subscribe. Share this with your friends if you think it's meaningful. And I hope you have a wonderful week. Grace and peace, friends.